behind Mary Shelley's vision. Mary Shelley's life was, was almost as tragic as the creature's life in, in Frankenstein. What extraordinary forces conspired to trigger this teenage girl's imagination? Was Frankenstein the product of a hellish nightmare? Or could there have been a real Dr. Frankenstein? And if so, who was he? Also, the people around in this area think that Dippel was Frankenstein. Konrad Dippel is Frankenstein. I know he collected limbs, I know he collected bones, I know he collected blood. We'll look at Hollywood's many versions of the story of Frankenstein. Ranging from the sublime... Frankenstein! ...to the ridiculous. That's Frankenstein. This is a nice boy. Wow! He's alive, alive! It's alive, it's alive. It's alive. We will hear how some scientific experts feel it may be too late to heed the warning of Frankenstein. Are they right? Is genetic engineering the Frankenstein of our day? This technology is perhaps the most powerful and potentially dangerous technology ever conceived by human beings. So beware and be warned. Tonight could change the way you think about the name Frankenstein forever. Stay with us as we tell you about the real Frankenstein, an untold story. There really is a Castle Frankenstein. This medieval fortress is just a few miles from the River Rhine, south of the German town of Gersheim, a town that Mary Shelley visited a full two years before she wrote her famous novel. Pure coincidence? Well, you can be the judge. If the stones of this long-ruined castle could speak, they would tell of the 500-year history of the Baron von Frankenstein. Local castle folklore is filled with stories of brave knights and devastating wars, of dragon slayers and evil curses. But the most startling story of them all is of a brilliant and obsessed scientist born here who robbed graves searching for the key to immortal life. Some say it was this tale that inspired Mary Shelley to write a book whose story has filtered down to us through the lens of a movie camera. Hollywood provided the basic plot points. A mad scientist, aided by a hunchbacked assistant, digs up bodies and fashions them into a hideous creature. Electrified by lightning, the creature comes to life. Eventually, he kills a lot of innocent people and then meets his death at the hands of an unruly mob of German peasants. But is that the story Mary Shelley wrote? The story published anonymously in 1818? Well, hardly. Not even close. Because ever since Thomas Edison, made the first Frankenstein movie back in 1910, filmmakers have played fast and loose with Mary Shelley's original novel. Thought for years to have been lost, here is rarely seen footage from Thomas Edison's silent classic. The melodrama that Edison created was inspired by the many stage versions of Frankenstein that had been produced throughout Europe. Then, when the talkies were invented, sure enough, the story of the mad scientist who dared play God was one of the first to make it to the silver screen, albeit with a few Hollywood additions. There were many elements within both the play and uh, the picture that didn't exist in uh, the book. Igor, the assistant, who has become a great character in his own right. Oh, Igor. Uh, Igor, I mean, everybody needs an assistant. 
And this is all probably, you know, have to do with, with you know, the, the 30s and the way the workers felt. You know, it's the time of the Depression. They're all underpaid. They're not highly qualified. They, they don't have a contract. They don't have a deal. The criminal brain, the lightning, uh, the peasants with the torches and so forth. All of these are very good cinematic devices. But the lightning and the German peasants, I don't know. I think they're, they're always good, you know, because they, you know, they, they wear those funny hats with a little brush on the side. And sh they wear short pants. And fire looks good. I mean, you know, it's very photogenic fire. Well, it's very interesting when you look at those films. They're quite brilliant uh, visually. And also, um, Boris Karloff is marvelous as the, the creature. I mean, he... He acts beautifully with his eyes, he's very still, and it's only really, actually, as time's gone on, that the indelible mark that he made has somehow, through imitation, become sort of a cliché, but the original Karloff performances are beautiful. Forrest Ackerman, founder and editor of famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, recalls the impact Karloff made. Some time, I believe Mr. Karloff had to report to the studio around 5 o'clock in the morning, and... Uh, he uh, kept a veil over his head, didn't want people to lose their appetites at noontime. And, and one time, I dream, believe he uh, drove home in, the, in his automobile wearing the makeup, and uh, I think he frightened a cop to death. <laughs> Pioneer makeup man Jack Pierce went to great lengths to frighten us. In his own words, quote, I figured that Frankenstein was a scientist, but no practical surgeon. He would cut the top of the skull straight across like a pot lid, hinge it, pop the brain in, and then clamp it on tight. That is the reason I decided to make the monster's head square and flat like a shoebox. He said, I defy any doctor to say that, that if actually a, a person uh, built a human being out of bodies in the graves, the gallows, anywhere, that uh, this is the way it would look. Between 1931 and 1990, there were over 40 Frankenstein films released. Among them were such cult classics as Frankenstein's Bloody Terror, Frankenstein's Kung Fu Monster, Frankenstein's Great Aunt Tilly, Frankenstein Conquers the World, and The Revenge of Frankenstein. You will witness scenes never before seen on a motion picture screen. You will see Frankenstein take the eyes of one man, the brain of another. You will see lifeless hands begin to move. You will see a man turn into the world's most terrifying monster. These B-movies today seem campy and funny. But one Frankenstein film got laughs by design. Mel Brooks's Young Frankenstein poked fun at Hollywood's embellishments of the original novel. Life, do you hear me? Give my creation life! The original makeup, because it was shot in black and white, is really, uh, uh, even though it looks quite gray and pale, is actually a light green. Oh, it's this big green guy. But the, and, and yeah, I can, I, I can still hear it as old yesterday, Mel leaping up in his office and saying, I want a zipper, a zipper right here. No bolt, a zipper. I thought Peter Boyle's portrayal was wonderful. Hello, handsome. And then also continuing in that vein, the, the love scene with Madeleine Kahn and the old, I think it was Paul Henry's uh, romantic uh, gesture of lighting two cigarettes and handing one uh, to the girl. He said, no, what if I do a thing, you know, after we do it, we, we uh, I like to uh, two cigarettes and light it up. And he said, wonderful, all right, do that, just like Paul Henry. Penny for your thoughts. Mm. <laughs> You're incorrigible. Aren't you? Mm. You little zipper neck. The experience was like being part of this uh, wonderful uh, improvisational company of actors. Calm down. With this, <laughs> you know, crazy genius directing it. Whoa! 
after the spoof Frankenstein, the next great development on the theme came in 1990 from producer-director Roger Corman. In Corman's Frankenstein Unbound, a scientist named Dr. Buchanan goes back to a 19th century that never existed. Reference Mary Shelley. Born Mary Wollstonecroft Godwin. Mary Shelley, born 1797, died 1851. She is chiefly remembered as the author of the novel Frankenstein. It's a world in which Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, lives. You live in the 19th century, and yet you understand the future infinitely better than I do. And Dr. Frankenstein also lives. have both the creator and the creation coexisting in this world. You made me. Now you would destroy me. Why? In my version of the creature, I tried to remain true to Mary Shelley's vision. I did not ask to be made monstrous. He essentially was a great tragic figure, aware of his limitations, yet at the same time, also aware of the wonderment within him as a human being. I am alone and miserable. Make me a mate as you promised. I will never make another like you. But it was only in 1994 that British director and actor Kenneth Branagh became the first filmmaker to embrace completely Mary Shelley's original novel. Years from now, probably two actors will be most remembered for playing Frankenstein's creature. Boris Karloff, of course, for making the creature famous. And Robert De Niro for being the most famous actor ever to play the creature. When he finds out exactly where uh, he comes from and who has created him, he becomes an avenging creature, someone full of rage and full of danger, full of anger. And once again, there's, there's no actor who can do that so convincingly or so threateningly as, as Robert De Niro. We looked at some of the most uh, uh, difficult to read books I've come across, the, the, the uh, Color History of Facial Reconstruction, which is a, a, an encyclopedic book, an incredible, fascinating medical book, but it's, you know, don't eat before you read it, is what I'd say. So we, we worked out how, um, in this primitive way, in a sort of butchered fashion, he'd be, he would be stitched back together with a piece of jaw and another eye socket and a different leg. And, um, and you know, what would be the quality of the stitching? What would we use? What is it about this creature, this story, that haunts us so? I think the interest of the film industry in, in Frankenstein um, really is produced by the fact that this is a myth. The myth of what happens when a single human being tries to radically change nature. That's what all of modern science and technology is trying to do. And that's why we can't forget this story. It's constantly coming back. Victor Frankenstein, for all his good intent, he's like Macbeth in Shakespeare, or like Faust. He shakes hands with the devil. He basically says, if you give me that one piece of knowledge, um, just give me that one piece of knowledge, I'll make, I'll make everything work out. And of course, the moment that creature is born, I mean, it's all over. Do you share my madness? Who are you? My name. Is a Victor Frankenstein. And inevitably, there's a cautionary tale to be told there that we are getting into areas we don't understand. And of course, that comes up with modern genetic engineering and so forth. A hideous creature, a mad scientist. Did these ideas spring fully blown from Mary Shelley's imagination or from her dreams? Or was there, in fact, a real Dr. Frankenstein? Stay tuned.
the real... About where Mary Shelley got the idea for what became one of the greatest horror classics of all time. Well, one thing's for sure. She said that the impetus occurred at a renowned literary gathering that took place on the shores of Lake Geneva, some 350 miles from the castle, on a dark and stormy night. Sounds spooky? It was. June 16, 1816 must be the most remarkable night in literary history. UCLA professor Anne Malore is the author of Mary Shelley, Her Life, Her Fiction, Her Monsters. On that night, an 18-year-old girl had a dream which gave birth to what I think is the only true myth that has been written down by a single author ever. Ken Russell's 1986 film, Gothic, introduced us not only to Mary, but also to her famous poet husband, Percy Shelley. Did you see the lightning? One could hardly avoid it, sir. It was like the end of the world. Then Together they spent much of the summer of 1816 in the company of the noted Lord Byron, yet another brilliant, controversial and radical English poet. The more I read your poems, Shiloh, the more beauty I find. It was well past midnight on the evening of June the 16th. And after a night of reading aloud German ghost stories, Byron dared each of the assembled to compose his or her own tale of horror. Yes, our own ghost stories. I've always wanted to write the idea of a classical vampire. I'm too restrained by narrative prose. <laughs> Not so, Miss Godwin. Oh, I defer to the more experienced writers. In fact, Byron did pen a short poem about a vampire. But in an odd twist of fate, it was not England's two famous writers who rose to the challenge that night, but Mary Shelley and Byron's personal physician, Dr. John Polidori. What about a dark English nobleman who draws women to him, sucks their blood and discards them empty? Oh, yes. Dr. Polidori wrote a tale, The Vampire, which was eventually published and is considered by some to be a precursor to Bram Stoker's classic Dracula. So remarkably like twins from hell, it is possible that both Frankenstein and Dracula were born on that same stormy night. Several nights later, um, she was. She woke up in the middle of the night and said, "Well, there, there I saw him. I saw the student of the unhallowed arts kneeling at my bedside." Did this terrifying vision spring from a dream, as Mary later claimed? There was something at the window looking at me. And she was possessed by the story of Victor Frankenstein and his uh, uh, pursuit of, of creation. And, uh, and it sort of spewed forth, this thing, um, and uh, she finished it the next year, uh, published it, and of course they thought it was, had been written by her husband. Such were, the, uh, such were the way in which uh, female authors were regarded in that day. This story of Lord Byron's challenge and Mary's subsequent nightmare is widely accepted as the origin of her famous tale. But one historical detective has another theory. A theory that that night may have triggered memories. Memories of a visit here to Castle Frankenstein. Professor Radu Florescu, author of In Search of Frankenstein, has retraced Mary Shelley's steps and discovered that two years before, in 1814, she may have visited the castle and been exposed to the tale of a grave-robbing scientist by the name of Johann Conrad Dipple. Professor Florescu and I spoke inside the Frankenstein Chapel, surrounded by effigies of long-dead members of this famous family. Professor, word of background at the beginning. At the time we're talking about, Mary herself was, in fact, in the middle of a scandalous affair, as it was seen, with one of Britain's greatest poets, wasn't she, at the time, and had, in fact, eloped with him. Yes, the scandal 
I think was partially due to her age, 16. Shelley was 21. He was married. He had two children. Scandalous it was. Eerily, this painting depicts Mary and Percy courting by the tomb of her dead mother, renowned pioneer feminist Mary Wollstonecraft. They literally went to the grave of Mary Wollstonecraft every afternoon. And the story has it, that's where they first made love to each other. The secret lover's emotional and sexual passion for each other was reputedly so explosive that when they were forbidden to see each other, Percy threatened to commit suicide. At that point, Mary knew that she could never give him up. July the 18th, 1814. Mary and Percy fled to Europe. Percy abandoned his wife, Harriet, and two children, and the couple were renounced by both sets of parents. Now, we know it is a recorded fact that they came down the Rhine in September of 1814. But what is it that convinces you that after they docked, that they made the journey here? The castle's towers were clearly visible from Kernsheim, which was the little dock where, where they initially went. The probabilities of a visit, and this is my hunch, are quite formidable. It, it was all, all the guidebooks. They had lots of guidebooks and visited a lot of many castles along the way. Don't you think? Yeah, this is Frankenstein's castle. Mary and Percy, having stirred up an international scandal, were a hunted couple who may have found escape in this haunted castle. Unbeknownst to them, their affair would also have tragic consequences. Percy's abandoned wife, Harriet, distraught and pregnant with her third child, would ultimately throw herself off London's Putney Bridge and drown. Professor Florescu conjectures what the couple may have done next after allegedly visiting the castle. But I think they eventually went to an inn called Frankenstein's Hof, which means the Frankenstein's Inn. And this is when I think they began to get involved in the essence of the Frankenstein story. Excuse me. Imagine this possible scene. Come Sie rein, come Sie rein. Come, come. Madame? Upper class Englishman dropping in from nowhere to a rural tavern. The local German beer must surely have broken the ice. Let's drink to Frankenstein. <laughs> and of all the stories that they might have heard that night at the tavern, what do you believe was the most fantastic of all? Well, it's a story of a strange man whose name was really Conrad Dippel, who was born in this castle. I would describe him as, in many ways, as very similar to Victor Frankenstein. When we return, we will reveal for the very first time exactly what secrets Mary may have learned. The unsettling tale of an alchemist, scientist, and grave robber who could have been the real Victor Frankenstein. Stay tuned. Many people agree that Mary Shelley was a true visionary. But what were the forces at work on this 18-year-old girl's mind that provoked so potent an image of man playing God? She claimed that she had been inspired by a nightmare. But could her imagination have been sparked, in fact, by the half-remembered tale of a grave-robbing scientist that she learned about first here at Castle Frankenstein? Professor Radu Florescu believes that during a stop at a nearby tavern, Mary and Percy Shelley first heard the haunting tale of the birth of Johann Conrad Dippel. And now I tell you the real story of the castle of Frankenstein. Only the local people from here, they know the story, you know? On the 10th of August, 1673, a baby was born by the name of Conrad Dippel. Date was August 10th, 1673. 
At that time, the castle was being invaded by the forces of Louis XIV, and the birth, I, as I conceive it, in a castle full of wounded people, perhaps, soldiers, must have been very difficult. They must have found a little corner in the castle where the event took place. The birth of this man who occupies such a very important place in the story of, in my view at least, in the story of Mary's inspiration. So Dipple was not in fact a member of the Frankenstein family. No, he assumed that name. Dipple was obsessed with Frankenstein. He was proud of the fact he was born in a castle, the owners of which had fled. Dipple's signature was proof of his obsession with the castle Frankenstein. He enrolled in university, signing himself Frankensteiner, which means the man who came from the road of the castle. The name of the castle thus stuck to his name to the end of his life. And what are the parallels that you see between the life of Dipple and, on the other hand, the fictional life of Victor Frankenstein? He studied at Gießen, not too far away, as Victor studied at Ingolstadt. Dipple thought he was above the average of mankind. In that respect, I think he does remind us of Victor in many ways, who thought that he had little to learn from his masters at the university, and he wanted to create a following for himself. Conrad Dippel was by all accounts an extraordinary man. He was a doctor and a theologian, an alchemist and a palm reader. He was a firebrand who could easily gather a crowd for his radical ideas. But it was his extremist pursuit of scientific knowledge that constantly got him in trouble with the authorities. He had to flee from places, he was put in jail, he had to flee from Strasbourg. What was the gossip about why that was? Rumour had it that he dug up graves and collected cadavers. Some of the people of Niederbeerbach had told that uh, Dippel rubbed graves. People of Niederbeerbach began telling he is rubbing graves. He takes the uh, arms and the legs out of the grave. He is a very bad man, you have to have an eye on him. Conrad Dippel reportedly conducted macabre medical experiments. Indeed, it seems likely one of his laboratories may have been near the castle where he was born. As a historian, I have no documents to that effect. Uh, I have suspicions. I know he collected limbs, I know he collected bones, I know he collected blood. Now, that involves strange things, such as dissecting bodies. Boiling bones and various other parts of the human body. Ten hunt. Dippel was a very passionate man. He was driven by his ideas. He wanted to find out what is behind the wall. Frankensteiner. For his passion to find out what's the human body working. That was his passion to find out. And he would give up everything and anything he has done before and he has had before. Victor Frankenstein in Mary Shelley's book is a physician who wanted to build a new mankind with blood and arms and legs from a grave. And the same things Dippel tried himself. And in fact, he created a medicine, which I would like to try myself, called Dippel's Oil, which had a tremendous reputation at that time. It really made his name. But he believed that he could prolong life. He said he was going to live to the age of 135, didn't he? And he didn't make it. 
He never made it, and he died in his properties. Whether it was a mistake, whether he was poisoned by one of his numerous enemies, these are questions which we simply do not know. He died convulsed with foam coming out of his mouth, bluish in face. It would be ironic if he should have died by a concoction that he himself helped create. Approximately three and a half years after Mary and Percy sailed up the Rhine, Frankenstein was published. Despite its success, from then on, Mary Shelley was beset by a series of misfortunes from which she never really recovered. We are dead. Our creature. It will be there waiting in the shadows, in the shape of our fears. Until it has seen us to our deaths. Mary Shelley's life was, was almost as tragic as the creature's life in, in Frankenstein. Mary lost many of her friends. Lord Byron succumbed to fever fighting for Greek independence. And his physician, Dr. Polidori, author of The Vampire, in a bizarre coincidence, took his own life by drinking prussic acid, a potent poison based on a formula discovered by, of all people, Johann Conrad Dippel. Almost as if she were cursed. Three of Mary's four children died before the age of four. And a few years after the publication of Frankenstein, her beloved husband, Percy Shelley, set sail into a storm and drowned. It's as though her life ended at that moment. His death, perhaps, was a sort of eternal punishment. His body was burnt on the beaches of Italy because of the rules of the quarantine. But one of their friends snatched the heart of Shelley out of his body, and she kept it in a book for the rest of her life. Real Frankenstein will return in a moment on Discovery Sunday. To Castle Frankenstein. It's been 300 years since Johann Conrad Dippel was born here, and the castle is still alive with Frankensteins. In fact, Halloween here only underlines the point that when it comes to pop culture, Frankenstein is still at the top of the charts. Well, he's become rather lovable um, and, and has become, you know, uh, sort of transmogrified into the, the Munsters and the Adams family, and he's become a part of sort of 20th century folklore through the movies. But beyond the commercial popularity lurked the darker ethical questions that Mary Shelley raised. The message always was don't tamper in God's domain, don't meddle with things man was meant to leave alone. And if you try to find out everything without asking what will happen with it, you'll end in darkness and loneliness. What's happened to you? How can you live here like this? And that stench! Don't go in there! <laughs> I think she was tremendously visionary. In fact, you could say that Frankenstein is the first example of genuine science fiction that we have and really does present the first powerful critique of, of modern science and the possible dangers and damages that it can do. Almost 180 years after Frankenstein was written, we stand on the verge of a scientific revolution which makes Mary Shelley's horrifying vision seem almost tame. The onset of the technological age Mary warned about has come to pass. 
bringing with it nuclear weapons, artificial hearts, robots, and most remarkably, perhaps, the discovery of the building blocks of life itself. But it all began with the discovery of electricity. When Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, scientists were first experimenting with electricity. And electricity was believed, quite correctly, to have great powers. One of them was even uh, the possibility of bringing the dead back to life. It takes a lot of electricity to get a creature going. If he's been dead, I mean, you've got to give him a zetz, a shot. You gotta give him such a jolt. It, it seemed to restore life. It certainly made muscles twitch. Um, Shelley herself knew of the early days of batteries and galvanism. Galvani's nephew, Luigi Aldini, had come to believe that electricity was life itself. And so he was applying positive and negative charges of electricity to all sorts of dead things, uh, dead vegetables, dead animals, frogs, and also dead people. Their doctors treat patients by inserting needles like these into the flesh at various key points. This scene from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was inspired by the galvanic experiments. Now, look at this. Here, Victor's mentor, Dr. Waldman, applies electricity to the severed arm of a monkey. The same technique that at that time was used on corpses. And the charge went through the body. They were applied to the fingers, the arms, the legs. The fingers began to move, the eyes opened and closed. And when they gave it a particularly strong jolt. Yes, how do you do? The whole body quivered and almost sat up. This is the experiment that Mary Shelley is remembering when she basically writes her novel. Oh, um, is this strong? No, this must work. <sighs> Let me help you, Professor. Frankenstein ushered in the dawn of a scientific age. One which led eventually to the cracking of what some say is the secret code of life itself. Genetic engineering is the application of engineering principles to genetics. This technology is perhaps the most powerful and potentially dangerous technology ever conceived by human beings. Jeremy Rifkin, author and activist, has been called the most persistent opponent of this emerging science which, like the science depicted in Frankenstein, deals with the very essence of life. We have thousands of scientists working in laboratories all over the world, and they're involved in experiments that I think would surprise uh, the average uh, person out in the public. A wide range of industries are currently financing genetic engineering research in the hopes of creating new drugs, conquering diseases, improving food resources, and breeding disease-resistant crops. Their work ranges from producing longer-lasting tomatoes to enabling a common horse to give birth to a far more endangered species, a zebra. In an effort to breed larger and leaner pigs, scientists took growth hormone from cows and injected it into swine. Professor Bernard Rollin, bioethicist and author of the book The Frankenstein Syndrome, notes some of the consequences. They develop some joint pro problems, some leg problems, um, kidney problems, uh, problems with reproduction. In other words, they, they were totally disastrous in ways that nobody could have predicted and in ways which impacted negatively on the animals. The scientists took a uh, gene from a firefly, the gene that actually emits light in the firefly. They placed that gene into the genetic code of a tobacco plant and that plant lights up 24 hours a day. Scientists took cells from a sheep and cells from a goat, fused them together, placed them in a surrogate animal, and that animal gave birth to a geep, G-E-E-P. Uh, most of the scientists tend to be very, very cautious. For example, there were mice uh, genetically engineered to be able to uh, be infected with the AIDS virus. The National Institutes of Health took extraordinary precautions 
precautions which, to my knowledge, had never been taken before to assure that those animals could not escape into the general mouse population. In addition to locked rooms and uh, boxes in those rooms and so forth, they used uh, moats made of bleach so that the animals, if they were to try to swim across, would be killed and so forth. I don't think in and of itself there's anything wrong with any area of knowledge. Humans have been meddling with nature since we crawled out, as it were, out of the primordial slime. If uh, genetic engineering is intrinsically wrong, so too is altering the course of rivers and changing landscapes and eradicating disease and so forth. In fact, genetic scientists are closing in on preventatives and therapies for afflictions that have crippled and killed mankind for thousands of years. Heart attacks, breast and colon cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, cystic fibrosis, schizophrenia. So why not just rejoice? Why be concerned? Well, some scientists claim that human genetic engineering could inevitably lead to a loss of human diversity in the world population. What would you say no to if you have available to you, potentially, the ability to manipulate changes at the conceptual stage, uh, at the stage of the embryo, to improve health or to ensure against uh, problems later on in life. The real question that every individual has to grapple with as we move into this brave new world of the 21st century is who makes the decisions? Who should play God? Who should decide what are the good and bad genes? Who do we entrust with the ultimate authority over the genetic blueprint of millions of years of evolution? Just because a technology is potentially available doesn't mean we ought to necessarily use it. Whenever I talk to audiences of scientists, about this issue. I point out to them that although Frankenstein was the name of the scientist, virtually everybody thinks it's the name of the monster. And I try to leave them with that little message that ultimately any untoward consequences which emerge from injudicious use of the tool of genetic engineering will be laid four square the blame will be laid four square at the feet of the scientists. I will have revenge. Frankenstein! The real Frankenstein. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the past to explore the origins of an enduring legend. Is genetic engineering the Frankenstein science of our day? Was Mary Shelley inspired by more than a nightmare? Could Johann Conrad Dippel have been the real Frankenstein? The creative process remains a mystery, but it is said that whoever can imbue mankind with a myth has achieved more than the most daring inventor. So it's a case of thank you to Mary Shelley for the hours of pleasure laced with terror and vice versa, and for the warnings which we do well to heed. From the Castle Frankenstein, good night. Coming up next, did vampires really exist? Join the search for Dracula on Discovery Sunday. Tomorrow, begin a week of the natural world's wildest creatures on Wild Discovery, only on the Discovery Channel.